what I know about Seagrave is that they start in a little suburb, a little town outside of uh, Detroit. And Frederick Seagrave makes ladders that are used by apple pickers. And they're so strong that fire companies start to order them. But it will be 10 years before they come to Columbus. Then he is in a little part of Lane Avenue, which the town takes the name of Seagrave, and you can actually still see that it's there. They move to the south side because, well, the location explains a lot. Mm -hmm. Where are they located on this map? <laughs> right, just below the city line. Right, so they were able to avoid city taxes, mm -hmm. like a lot of manufacturing on the south side. Some things never so change. they're here on High Street, and then all of this will start to come in with Buckeye steel and mm -hmm. castings. Seagraves essentially moved here in 1892 and began building horse-drawn fire wagons at the time. Everything was done here? All the hand detailing and painting, everything? Our understanding was that everything was done here. You know, you can envision it when you get a sense of how big the complex is and how, how many spaces there are. And it's really kind of neat because from the courtyard's perspective, there was a rail siding on the north side of this building where we stand, and there was a dock over there, and so the fire engines were made here, they were rolled out to that dock, and then put on rail cars and hauled away. The author here notes is that the plant on High Street made more components for its vehicles than anyone since Ford and his Model T. Ladders, hoods, frames, grills, pumps, and engines were just the start, all made here at this location uh, with a pre-depression level of 350 employees. From this picture, it looks like they're assembling engines. So it looks like they're going from having the, the, uh, the engine actually in the space, mounting it on the chassis, and then putting the body on over that. Yeah, so here's the painting. It doesn't indicate exactly from here, but from our best recollection, uh, it would be kind of right above where we are now. This will be space in the building that's just north of us over there. Okay. Um, and so these are, this is where the metal work was done and the machining. It was done up on the second floor above that. Mm -hmm. What's neat is there's a lot of images from the outside looking in this space. Oh, that's, okay. they had, it was kind of their backdrop where they took images of a lot of the fire engines as they went mm -hmm, out mm -hmm. to go all across the country. It's interesting that the south side becomes not just their home, but it is so well remembered by people who past this building, mm -hmm. they can identify it even though the company's been gone since right. the 60s. That's right. yeah. So I would love to see more if we get a chance to walk around. Sure, be great. Okay. Sure. Doreen, here's an example of some pieces that we make. These ultimately end up in a retail environment. This is the bones, woodworking done over there, comes okay. over here to be upholstered. We do a fair amount of custom work too. There's a piece over there that'll uh, eventually be a, a seating booth for a local establishment. How did it all begin? My father-in-law and his father started the business basically in a garage. It was their story, it was a chicken coop, but you know, it was, it was a small building that they started. His dad was a deaf mute. And so my father-in-law at, he's 80, six now, so at 15, he was the face and voice of the business. He would literally knock on doors of sample books and say, you know, do you need any upholstering? And it was much different then. I mean, people bought furniture thinking they were gonna have that furniture for a long time. So reupholstering was a natural process. It was less expensive than new. That changed a bit as furniture became less and less built for the long term and, and of course cost less at that point. Our history was uh, just residential upholstering. We worked for a lot of the local designers. We did their upholstering. Started getting into commercial upholstering 25 years ago maybe. And then when Justin joined the business, that was the kind of the aha moment to say, this is another avenue for us, this commercial side of upholstering. And that's really helped us to, to balance the ups and the downs of both those businesses. We're bigger than the average upholstery shop is usually just a couple of guys, right. um, you know, doing a few hundred thousand dollars of the work. So we're, we're much larger than that. We're at 45 people now. So this has got to be the most humongous building I've ever seen in Columbus. How much square footage do you have in this space? 
well, like with old buildings, you get multiple. We've had three different estimations, anywhere okay. from 209,000 square feet to 242,000 square feet. Okay. We, we know a little bit that we'd be getting into a project when we moved in um, and had some priorities when we first moved in, like the space that we're in now is the original portion of the whole complex. It has these neat tin ceilings, um, which we felt really added a great amount of character to the space, but we added LED lighting. Uh, we replaced windows. We have a lot of natural light, which we really haven't had mm -hmm. in our other location. And those were exciting things, big bang for your buck. And then we spent a lot of money on the roof that uh, you know had old tar and several different iterations of roofing styles over the past 130 years. I'll follow you, gentlemen. Okay. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. So of course, in this building, there's a lot of stuff that we'll never really use. Some of this is set up for some of the large equipment that they had in here originally. Well, the nice thing about working in a former fire apparatus company is there's fire doors. So these are fire doors, huh? Every 20 steps. So from here, you've got a great view of the courtyard. Oh, yeah. You can see. Part of the old yeah. sign. Mm-hmm. And we do wish these walls could talk. As the trains speed up and slow down, there's a lot of crashing and banging and booming. Right. So the first few times it happened, everybody in the shop would just stop and, and right. look, but now they don't even hear it anymore. Do you know what was done in this space before when Seagrave was here? We believe this space was where they put together a lot of the woodworking that went down. You don't realize how much wood was on one of those old wagons, but mm -hmm. the seating was basically wood, the wheels, the, the ladders. It's yeah. kind of nice the way the viaduct is just passing by the second story. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, it, it adds a charm to it. Yeah. What creative things are going to happen here? How much time do you Clean, have? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've talked to several folks. Um, there's a collective of young ladies who work on designing and making their own clothing. Mm -hmm. And so they're uh, looking for 10,000 square feet and love this area with the natural light. We have talked to distilleries, making rum, making beer. Uh, it kind of lends itself well to that. In a lot of different ways, there's these old elevator shafts that it can accommodate, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. tall um, equipment like that. But, you know, this whole second floor is uh, 30,000 square feet. And so yeah. we could envision it being a co-working space, you know, just kind of open with all the natural light coming in. It could be an event space, a really nice open event space. But you've got a view of the south side of downtown from there. So what do you think you'll be doing next now that you've got the building well in hand? Together, we look to continue to grow. You know, we have the space now in this area, and uh, you look back at the history of Seagraves and how they expanded in here. Uh, we'd love to uh, mimic that story and continue to grow and add some jobs to the south side here in Columbus. And again, you know, bring in some other new folks and new neighbors into the rest of the building to complement what we're doing or just be fun and good neighbors. So the sky's the limit, really.